Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Road. Today, we're going to do something special. We're going to do um, interviewing World War II and uh, veterans. We did this last year. We had a two-part special for Veterans Day, and it was well-received. And I personally believe that Veterans Day should be about veterans, not about politicians running for, for office. The, to me, I just find something wrong about um, some 24, 25-year-old English major speechwriter writing something for a politician to talk about on Veterans Day. It just doesn't um, catch, up, catch, up the, catch the spirit. Me, I had the honor and privilege of sitting down with a number of veterans that have served in um, World War II. Um, when we had the, when Monadnock Aviation was able to bring in the um, B-17 and the B-24 and the, the P-51. It's amazing when you sit down and, and talk to these gentlemen. The connectivity, the, the uh, it's, it's just really awe-striking. Awe you, you just... It's one of those, you're kind of like in the presence of a championship horse. There's just something about these individuals. They accomplished a lot, but they don't come across as egotistic or it's about me. One gentleman that I talked to flew 37 missions in a B-24, Mr. Hale. I didn't think much of it, you know, Mr. Hale didn't catch me until I found out later on that the Hale building at Keene State College is one of his family building, or that his father, his grandfather, was the governor of New Hampshire. Another individual, Mr. Carl. Again, I didn't think much of it until we found out that his father was at Keene State College, and the first dorm that I stayed in when I was at Keene State College was Carl Hall, and it was named after his father. Another individual I sat down and talked to was about the Berlin Airlift. I've read many stories about the Berlin Airlift. I had watched movies about the Berlin Airlift, but I have never ever met someone who took part in the Ber Berlin Airlift. He's going and saying, well, it's no big deal. Bang, bang, I was just doing my job. That's it, just doing the job. They had a responsibility, they stood up, they took responsibility, and they moved on. It wasn't what are you going to do for me before I'm going to do something for you? This year I, didn't interview, I wasn't able to interview a woman, but these men and women, they, they were awesome. They were, like I said, these are, they set the example which I wish that all our leaders today could emulate. But, you know, when, when you go down in some of the details, when the individuals say, hey, they went in and took every single one of our sea bags you know, the ones with our names and our service number on, and they filled them up with coal because they were so much easier to drop off in Berlin <clears throat> than the regular coal. Or the individual saying, well, the pilots, they would take too long, so they would go down into the restaurant. So instead, they brought the good-looking women to the pilots so the planes could return, load and get on the air as quick as possible. So I hope you enjoy um, the comments by these men and women. Um, a copy of this will be put down at King State College, so if, if you want to go back in the future to look at it, and also at the Historical Society. These guys were historic, and so I will not be coming back to close with this. There isn't anything I can say that can make this any better. These individuals do their own talking, and so again, to any other veteran, Happy Veterans Day. You deserve it. It's your day. Thank you.
I'm here with Derek Ward from the Collings Foundation. What is the Collings Foundation? The Collings Foundation is a nonprofit educational foundation that uh, organizes living history events. What type of living history events? Well, uh, today at the airport, we have a B-17, the B-24, and the P-51, uh, all uh, aircraft from the World War II uh, that were very instrumental in uh, the European theater and also elsewhere. One of the things I seem to, to notice about when I've gone out and so like, they're so little compared to what the picture, you get them in these big movies, they look like humongous airplanes and you have 10, 12, 13 people pouring out of them after they land. Yeah, it's, it's a very tight fit in both the, the, both the aircraft and we don't even have them completely outfitted. They actually had more oxygen tanks and the uh, bulletproof armor in some areas. Uh, very tight quarters, especially for 10 men for eight, nine hours apiece. It would be very cold, very cramped. And so <clears throat> your organization goes around the country putting on these displays? And right. Instead, the, the Collings Foundation's vision, instead of uh, putting these aircraft in a museum where only uh, maybe 300,000 people a year would see them, let's make them flyable. Let's take them around the country 10 months out of the year, seven days a week, 110 cities a year, and let people actually see them operate, go for rides, walk through the aircraft, and really get the experience. Uh, and it helps gain a whole new appreciation for what the veterans did. Yeah, because when you go, the noise, the vibrations, the smells, it, yeah. it, it just, you, you can't describe it. If you're in a museum, right. it's usually nice, it's, clean. Right it's, right, it's nice, clean, you're usually roped off, you can't even touch the airplane here, you can walk through the airplane, bang your head. <laughs> you know, which there's lots of spots to do that, but uh, it's, it's a tremendous, uh, and brings out the veterans, and it allows people to interact with the veterans as well, and hear the stories firsthand. Yeah, because, like I was saying before, I spent 21 years in Marine Corps, both in aviation and ground, and I, I studied history, but just talking to some of the veterans I've been talking today, when they say, well, you know, on the B-24, I was a um, bombardier, only the pilot and the co-pilot had seats on 12, 14 hours, 10 people. And you, you sit there and go, I never knew that. Right. We had another guy who was talking how he was in the Berlin airlift. And so it, it kind of like, this gives them an opportunity to have a voice. It does. And it allows, not only that, it allows people that maybe lost loved ones or have a loved one that's no longer present to see uh, and experience the aircraft that their, their father or their grandfather served in. Uh, it's a really powerful and moving experience to interact with all those people, veterans or the families of veterans. Uh, tremendous. Because I've noticed that. <clears throat> you got people my age, I'm in my 50s, who uh, basically there would be sons and daughters, but they're with their dads. Right. And they're going and you can see the look and it's like, wow, dad did this. It's, right. It kind of like this is real now. It's yeah. It's not a picture on the wall or someone right. in uniform. It's not a movie. Right. You're you're actually giving the veteran and their sons and daughters and their grandkids an actual connection. Right. Exactly. It, it's it's a very, you know, this is this is my eighth year, and uh, it's still amazing hearing the different stories each year, meeting different families. And, and watching them experience the, the aircraft uh, and listen to the other, other veterans' stories, it's, it's really a neat, a neat vision the Collings Foundation had to, in order to do that. Uh, and I think it's something that the country needs as well. Because we, I was coming here and we were comp the youngest World War II veteran is 82 years old. Right. And I interviewed one guy who was 87 years old. And other, you put life in these, you, you can see that spark in, these planes have put life in these people. Some of the people that were wheelchaired here from nursing homes, yeah. they left with a sparkle that I guess only you guys could have done it. Nothing else could have put that sparkle, could put that life back into them. Correct. It's, it's, it, it's almost like it's a reconnection for them. It, it awakens some memories, stuff like that. And they remember, you know, a lot of them made very good friends back then, friends they were they fought side by side with. You know, they lost quite a few of them too, but they still have friends they still, and brings back fond memories of those people they served with and, and that's a very powerful connection and, and they just don't think about other stuff. Uh, you know, maybe their hips hurting or whatever. Well, when they're out here, it, it probably doesn't hurt because they're thinking about other stuff. It's, it's kind of like, <clears throat> I'm no longer 82 or 86. I'm that right. 17 or 18 year old scared out of yeah. my wit guy. Right. 
going on a mission, not knowing I'm coming back. I'm here with my buddies. Right. And all those adrenaline rush, all those emotions are all bound up. Yeah. Today, you're, getting, you're giving them an opportunity to relive them and release them. Right, right. exactly. And, and share and, and make sure that the, 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 new gen, the next generations that come understand what that generation did for us. It's a very, uh, it's amazing what that whole entire generation did for us from on the home front uh, or on the war front and also on the home front in order to manufacture and produce all the aircraft and the ships and the boats and the jeeps. That was a, the country came together as one uh, and it, it's something that we, we need to remember, we need to learn from and never forget. And it's not like the video game now, if you don't like it, you just press the reset button, you come back to life and you continue right. on going. For these gentlemen and even the women, it was real. It was real. And yes. the mistake had deadly consequences. Yes. Yeah. And so I want to thank you. I want to thank your organization. Again, it's Derek Ward and Derek the Collins Ward. Foundation. And you're doing wonders for a lot of these people. Yeah. Well, it makes our day as well. So thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Yeah. So we're here at Keene Airport, and we're now um, talking to another World War II veteran. Your name? Merv Frank. Mervin. Mervin. They, they call me Merv. I heard you're quite a character. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure many people would say that. Uh, I've, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so what did you do in um, well, we were you talking know, before? You know, I'm a retired policeman from the city of Keene, and, uh, but uh, militarily, I was in high school. I was a little bit beyond, behind the other kids. I was 18. I turned 18 in December of 1944. Well, you know, the war was pretty near Hi, over. Heavy. So I was drafted. I left school. I went into the, the uh, office and told them that I wasn't coming back after the, the semester was <laughs> over. So I finished the semester, and then I walked away. Drafted in March, took infantry basic training, Came home. I was in. I was in Georgia when the president died. President uh, Roosevelt. Roosevelt. In fact, we matched in from uh, training from the rifle range, and we saw the first sergeant walking real fast up the company street ahead of us. And uh, we we stopped, made a right face. They held us to attention, and he announced that uh, president died just up the road in in Georgia, Warm Springs, Georgia. And they played taps and they dismissed us for the day. But uh, had my furlough after basic training, put us on a troop train heading for the Pacific, a rifleman, <laughs> an infantry soldier. And uh, we pulled into one of the cities as we approached the West Coast and people were holding up newspapers. And the newspapers proclaimed something about an atomic bomb being dropped someplace <laughs> in Japan. That terminated the, the war for my, for my purposes. So technically, I'm a World War II veteran, but I don't really hop on it because it's over. But I continued on. They kept us going. We went out to an atoll. I think it was Ulithi Atoll. Thou hundreds of ships, you know, for, for horizon to horizon. Apparently, that was a staging area for the invasion of Japan. And we stayed there a day or so. Probably, I think probably we're on radio silent, silent still. So they must have got the orders then to, where to ship us. And we went to the Philippines. Well, I got to the Philippines and the war was over. And they put me in a post stockade as a military policeman. I said, I'm an infantryman. <laughs> well, they said, you're going to be guarding American soldiers that have committed crimes. So I, they came out with an enlistment program. So I think I got, in, I got there in September. November, I re-enlisted. November, I enlisted in the regular army. Regular army yep. Chose the European theater for my assignment and went to Germany, again, as a military policeman. But this time, I did regular military police work. Yeah, town patrol in the city of Frankfurt and the town surrounding Frankfurt. Because a lot of people don't understand it. 45, 46, 48, there was a military there was constable. An occupation. That, you know, yeah. We occupied... Germany was divided into three uh, or four, four, four sections. Yeah. The American zone, the British zone, the French and zone, and the Russian, Russian zone. zone. And the capital of Germany, which people don't realize, was Berlin was inside the Russian, Russian zone. zone. So and that was a moving city. ahead to 1948, 
all of a sudden there was a currency change. The United States uh, implemented the currency change. They went to back to a German, the German mark. mark. And apparently this upset the Russians. So in 1948, I think it was around June, they announced that the roads, the canals, and the railroads were closed for all traffic going into Berlin. So well, was Berlin, Berlin that was the beginning of the Berlin airlift. airlift and suddenly hundreds of, of Air, Air Corps personnel arrived and uh, the airplanes started flying. And of course they started with C C-47s, yeah, yeah. which was a tail dragger. And they realized very quickly that if they were going to support Berlin entirely with coal, fuel, foodstuffs, if they didn't, they, they were going to, people were going to starve in Berlin. So they decided that it took too long to unload the tail dragger because the floor of the tail dragger was not level. So they brought in C-54s, which is a tricycle landing gear like the <laughs> B-24 out, out here. And uh, they, they developed a system of backing up the trucks and unloading those, those uh, aircraft in, in minutes or seconds and turned around. The crews used to get off and go in and have a snack. Well, that took time. So they found some good-looking German Fraulein's. <laughs> they put they they put these Fraulein's in, in vehicles mm. with snacks, snacks, sandwiches, and coffee, and they went out to the airplanes and and uh, refreshed the crew. So then they turned around back to Frankfurt. So it's Frankfurt to, to Berlin, Frankfurt to Berlin, back and forth. Yeah, because people don't realize there's almost really a hot landing, hot takeoff, stay, go, stay, yeah. go. I, I think this is a part of history that is pretty pretty much unknown to most people in the United States. As a matter of fact, one of the, one of the policemen I knew was selected to work with a reporter from Germany back a few years ago. And he came to me, he says, Mervyn, did you know that Berlin was, was closed off? I said, yeah, I know all about that, I was there. So, uh, yeah, because people yeah. don't understand how close we came back to, to, yeah. to going to war. You know, you know, every soldier has a barracks bag. Yeah. It's a heavy canvas bag with a strap on it, your name is stenciled on it, your serial number. We turn, every soldier in Germany had to turn their, their barracks bag in. And you know what they use it for? They loaded those barracks bags with coal briquettes, and this allowed them to load those, air, those C-54s quickly, and they took coal by air into Berlin to keep... What we in the Marine Corps call sea bags. Sea bag, yep. yep. And again, when you look geographically, people don't understand when you look at the map if you go home and look at the globe and you look at Keene and you go across people don't understand how far north Berlin and London are of, of Keene and so it can be quite cold in those areas and so so my military career I spent the three years in Germany met this good-looking gal married her and brought her back with me and we're still together. So she said that's the best decision you've ever made in your life, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And you know, the, the assignment that I had in, in Germany was kind of nice, just a company. We were a battalion, but we were, we were separated. And it was just a pleasant uh, military experience, the best that I had. Later on, we did combine into a battalion in the Fra in the Frankfurt, Maine, and things changed. But uh, after I got out of the service, I went on the Keene Police Department. I was there about a year. In June 1950, the North Koreans invaded South Korea. Well, you know, it didn't bother me any. I'm here. I've got my <laughs> career all set up. And one morning, the National Guard, uh, G Battery of the 197th National Guard, they pull up the Main Street in, in July or August, heading for summer camp in Fort Drum. And they pull up in the center of Main Street, where we used to allow parking down by the Crystal Restaurant and they have breakfast there. Well, some of them stayed in the trucks and I stopped and I teased them. I said, you think you're going to Fort Drum? I said, when you're in Fort Drum, you're gonna be activated. While they were in Fort Drum, I got a letter. You're activated. So I went to Korea as a reservist and served with the 24th Infantry Division. Oh, that's that's so, Fort Stewart, Georgia. 
the 24th yeah. is from Star Stur Trooper. Yeah, yeah. They're the 24th Armored Division now. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I didn't know that, but I, I, yeah. I know that something changed, yeah. 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 And so I want to thank you. And for me personally, I've studied history and I've studied the Berlin airlift, the whole works. I knew how important it was but I have never met anybody that was involved in yeah. that. Well, I wasn't that involved, but I was but in Franklin. Yeah, I, I so remember it very it's, well. It's, it's a There's a movie, uh, The Big Lift. Big Lift. Uh, Cleft, I think, is it? It's a good movie. It, it tells about it. There's a little love story there, but it's basically the background is a Berlin Airlift. <coughs> well, I, I'm running on. It's been a pleasure talking okay. to you, okay. too. And Thank we'll you. Very yeah. good. Chris. I'm here with William M. Hale, 24... 20, um, B twenty fours. B twenty fours. Yes. And you said you were a bombardier. I, I was a bombardier, first lieutenant. First, and we were talking about the Norton site. And yeah, and thirty seven missions with that. Thirty seven missions. Yeah. I thought you get to go home after twenty five. Was that just not Europe? for us? <laughs> oh, that was just the Europe. <laughs> I think that was more Europe, probably. And um, so you you were from the the Pacific, correct? Southwest Pacific. Um, where were some of the places that you were stationed at? Well, I was only stationed in one place permanently. That was the island of Moratai. And it was south of the Philippines, north of the equator. But uh, <coughs> had touched down when we flew our 24 over to the southwest Pacific. Johnson Island, which had one tree on it. Oh, Johnson Island, yeah. That's, then, a, that's a chemical warfare island right now. You oh, don't want to be, yeah, that's where all chemical warfare. Oh. You don't want to be on Johnson Island. No. And then we uh, flew to Tarawa for one night, Guadalcanal for one night, and then New Guinea. And we were in New Guinea for a month. You didn't find any good vacation spots on that, that trout. Well, it was a pretty good bathing area on Tarawa. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and so, how long were some of your flights? Oh, they lasted anywhere from 8 to 14 hours. 8 to 14 hours. Many of them were 12, 14 hours. And um, like I was telling the, talking to the other gentleman, if people have to fly from Los Angeles to Boston, they talk about how uncomfortable it is and how much you bear it. But when I go look at that B-24, it's nothing like it's in the movie. It's almost kind of like a miniature airplane. The only two seats were for the pilot and co-pilot. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the bombardier doing? Well, I was on my hands and knees looking into the bomb site when we were making a bomb run. And what elevation you, you fly at? Oh, anywhere from eight to 15,000 feet. And so that wasn't as bad as the temperature-wise wasn't that bad then, right? Oh, no. Southwest Pacific was pretty warm. And, um, and so, so you're looking at 14 hours, a 14-hour flight. Well, that, that has to really get really uncomfortable. Well, there were things to do. It uh, would take me close to an hour to get ready for a bomb run. But I didn't do anything until about two hours before the bomb run. The, when you talk about the being... Um, the bombardier. I know on some there's bombardier slash navigators. Or did you have separate ones or did you do both of those? No, no we had a navigator too, separate. In there and so, <clears throat> so did you ever get to go to some of the, the luxury places like Australia? No, mm -hmm. I got gypped on that one. <laughs> oh, in the movies, all these Air Force guys, you always, you, I mean, Air Corps always like to go to, um, what is it, Perth, um, Australia for their two weeks R&R. &R. Oh, yeah. My pilot, he borrowed this jacket from me to wear to Australia when he went on his leave. So your but jacket went to Australia, but your jacket <laughs> went, but I didn't. <laughs> Hopefully he didn't do anything wrong with your jacket to get you to get the blame for it. No, not really. <laughs> <clears throat> and so um, how long did you serve in the South Pacific? Uh, eight months. Eight months? I got there in January and... Uh, came back and in August I was on the ship coming home when they dropped the atomic bomb. So, <clears throat> so um, what did you think about the atomic bomb? 
Well, I have mixed feelings, but uh, I think it spared an awful lot of lives, and it would have been a bloodbath if we'd had to invade with uh, infantry and marines on the island of Japan. Yeah, because, well, if you look back now, 50, 60 years, you can look at it at a moralistic approach way from the distance. Yeah. But when you go in and look, for example, Hiroshima, Okinawa, when you just look at the, we talk now about the Iraq and Afghanistan, and even for the 10 years of Iraq and Afghanistan, that doesn't compare nothing to the six weeks in Okinawa. No. And to, to consider how, that's Okinawa, and that was just a Japanese colony, just to think of what happened to the mainland when they're talking about a million casualties. Oh, yeah. That number is not far-fetched. That's a pretty realistic number. Yeah, I know. I think probably there were fewer deaths with the dropping of the atomic bomb than there would have been if there had been an invasion. The, um, I said one of my tours, I received down in, in Panama, and we went down to Panama, and all of a sudden, on the Atlantic coast, there's a nice, beautiful hospital complex. And I was going, this is American hospital, and they had an American cemetery. I go, what is this for? And I was told it was for the evasion of Japan. I go, what do you mean? It said that they felt that the American public would not be able to deal with the devastation costs of evading Japan that the casualties would have been shipped to Panama and taken care of, and that would have been one of the census stories until after the evasion was over with. Oh, sure. And it's like, then you go, no, they don't talk to you about this in history, but it's like, wait a minute. We, we have a serious trouble. <clears throat> yes, if your family, 10 or 15 people get killed, then what we're talking about the amount of people, we're talking thousands of death and a yeah. lot of casualties. Those are tough decisions that commanders have to make, the president has to make. Oh, sure. Yeah. And so I know it, it's war, and war always has a lot of downside. Are there any things that are on the positive that you remember while serving in the South Pacific? Well, some of our missions ended up in a very positive way in, in that we hit the target and destroyed it. I remember one mission over Balakapapan in Borneo, and um, we hit oil wells. The smoke went up to 15,000 feet, and I have a photograph that was taken from our bomber when it was further out, leaving the target, and it shows all that smoke coming up right out of Balakapapan. And it just makes you feel good because you accomplished your mission and oh, yeah. you helped shorten the war. Right. And so, you have any um, competition between um, the Marines and the regular Army and the Navy? Who's better? No, we just simply had our job to do, and uh, they had their job. And I remember one mission over uh, northern Borneo. We were a couple of hours flying over just jungle, and uh, our target was going to be pointed out, and it was in the trees, and. Uh, there was mortar fire here, here, and there, and we had to bomb in between. And uh, when we dropped our bombs, we saw this huge explosion, and there was a British infantry officer in the nose of the bomber with me, and he was with the ground. And he said, my God, you just hit the Japanese ammunition dump. <laughs> Got to take credit for that, right? Yeah, and we didn't know it was there. And so that's forward air controller, you know, yeah. <laughs> way early. And so you had your eight years, I mean, eight months, 37 missions. So when the war was over, did you stay in or did you get to go home? No, I uh, was shipped right home and uh, I was discharged in December. So, so that was quick. How did you um, contact, keep touch with your family during the war? Just by letter. Just by letter? What, would, what did they call those ones they made the microfish? Did they? Uh, microfilm? Yeah, then they take a bunch of them. Um, they were talking about, <clears throat> I guess they, 
they took a lot of the letters, made them into microfilm, and then reproduced them so they can save space? Well, maybe they did. I, I wasn't aware of that. I know that just on uh, that thin air <laughs> paper. The onion paper. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right home, and uh, I guess that's what arrived home. Before we end up, how many people were on the, the B-24? Ten of us. Ten of us in that. A uh, pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, which I was, a navigator, and then we had a radio operator, an engineer, and then a nose gunner, top turret gunner, belly gunner, and a tail gunner. Those were the ten. The, um, I know talking to the other ones about the B-17, how important the P-51 was for the, the long range escorts and the survival of the B-17s. What did you use to escort the, the B-24s? Didn't have any. Didn't have any. We had the uh, Pacific Ocean. Because <laughs> that's what most of our missions were over. We'd be 90% over water. So it's, it's, it's one of those, it's, it's not like Germany where if you're over Europe, you get the bailout, you bail out over, yeah. over Europe. Yeah. You may end up in a POW camp, but you may, that's if you get to survive. Well, if you had to bail out where we were flying, you'd bail out into the water. And then there were these PBYs that flew uh, with us. And if any plane went down, they were able to land in the water and rescue the occupants, the flyers. Did anybody get rescued by submarines? Any? Uh, no, not that I know of. Just George Bush. George, yeah. <laughs> George. <laughs> Who would think the submarine would help save the future president of the United States? Well, I know and that that almost seemed to be forecast. <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman earlier had asked me about if I had gone to King State College, and I said I'd gone to King State College, and he asked me where I lived. I said I stayed in the um, Carl Hall, and he went and said, well. My father, the building is named after my father. Oh, wow. And so all of a sudden, you were talking about the Hale building at King State College. And my first interaction with the Hale building was the coach of the um, cross country team was also the financial aid director. And he was recruiting me and that's where I met him. That's the first time I get to King State College was the Hale building. But you have a connection to the Hale building. Well, it was named after my great grandfather, Samuel Whitney Hale who in the 1980s was governor of New Hampshire. And um, let me see, what else? Uh, what? 1880s? 18, oh. yeah. Yeah, 1880s. Yeah. And um, sorry for the era. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was also the house my father was born in. And so again, here it is, downtown Keene, another historic building a lot of people don't know about. And, but <clears throat> I guess when I look back at, at World War II veterans, it is it's so much different than Vietnam or veterans going forward is because there's a lot of us, if we didn't want to join the military, we didn't have to join the military, found ways to get out of the military. But there's a, a lot of people that could have got out of the military in World War II, didn't have to put their life in risk because they were well connected, but they stood up and they put the name on, on the dotted line. To yeah. Well, I signed up when I was uh, 17 and uh, took my entrance exam for the Army Air Force Cadet Training Program and uh, was accepted. and. Uh, one week after I turned 18, I was off and running with the cadets and getting trained. So are you about 85, 86 right now? 86, yeah. So you, you haven't stopped running, right? You may That's be a right. little bit slower, but you're yeah, still running. Yeah, I'm a little running. slower, but <laughs> <laughs> still going. <clears throat> but you got a lot of life. You get that excitement. Yeah. And so that plane bring more excitement back to you? Oh, sure brings back many fond memories. We had an absolutely great crew, and we were all good friends. And so, again, thank you, and I hope the memories stay with you, and I'm pretty sure they're going to. And, I think they will. And they'll burn brighter for a while, right? Yep. Yeah, okay.
Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I'm here with your name, please. Donald Cow. Donald. Yeah. And, and I live in Peterborough, Peterborough. But I grew up here in Keene. I was born and brought up here in Keene. And um, I was in World War II. In the, um, I trained in infantry. Uh, and then we went to Okinawa. And um, there they transferred me into a quartermaster company. And I had absolutely no idea what a quartermaster was, a quartermaster company. But it was the 27th quartermaster company of the 27th Infantry Division. And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, our job was to service the troops with supplies and so forth and so on, of which I am extremely thankful. Because if I, if I had stayed in the infantry, I have no doubt whatsoever that I wouldn't be here today because of how things were on Okinawa or even after, when I got there, it had started and all, but um, we would never have made it. But the quartermaster, I happened to drive a Jeep and uh, we survived. And then we went over to the... Um, uh, I went over to the 11th Airborne. I was with the 27th, and around Christmas time, uh, or a little after New Year's, uh, the division, everything was on numbers at that time. Um, I can't even remember what they called them, but we sure knew them. And, but I didn't have enough to rotate back, to rotate back because of, of my age and so forth. So uh, I was on the island of Honshu in, uh, with Japan for a year in occupation, and um, I wanted to get into the Air Force. And our division, the 27th, went home, but I didn't have enough points to go with it. So uh, I put in for my transfer of the 5th Air Force, which is over there. And don't tell anybody that the, um, uh, parachute, uh, well, oh, Jesus, Airborne. The Airborne, yeah. yeah. The Airborne is not all volunteer. No, the Airborne is not all volunteer. Not all volunteer, <laughs> because we didn't volunteer, and we ended up in the 11th Airborne uh, over in Sendai, Japan, and then we came home and we were discharged. But you know, they, you know how the guy goes and says, you want a little extra money in your pocket, you know? I know, cool. yeah. Well, our problem was that we had got that far. And we said, we're not going to go jumping out of any airplanes or anything else. We're going to keep our feet on the ground. We're going to keep our nose clean. And uh, we're going to go home. And when you, you talk about Okinawa, I spent a year on Okinawa. And um, it, I was at Fatima, it's a Marine Corps air station. But we were down from, um, called Zucaran, and then down at, at Naha. When, when you go down to Naha and you look at the caves and oh. even, <clears throat> I was there in 81, so that's about 30, but even 36, 36 years later, the housing development on the, we, we do construction, there were still bombs and other live ordnance all over it. It was just, uh, and w one of the things about the Pacific, uh, too, and with the Japanese, you see, we, we were being victorious and we were pushing them back. And they didn't have any time or any facility to bury all their dead and everything else. And, all. and you have to crawl over it and through it. And that's what the guys really got tangled up in and with the memories of, of the slaughter and stuff like that. And the, the other part about Okinawa was the, the mass suicides yeah. by the people and uh -huh. one of those, again, going overseas, we, oh, Japan. well, Okinawa uh -huh. was never part of Japan. Okinawa was conquered by, by Japan. Japan. And we used to, what I call what they call them, the Ryukins. They were a yeah. brown color instead of the, yeah. and the Japanese treated them like slaves and stuff. That's and what they, I understand. They, a yeah. lot of the slave labor yeah. for the fortifications, yeah. and those were a lot of the ones that committed the, the mass suicides. Right. 
and I know that would that had a lot of traumatic effect yeah. on, on a lot of soldiers coming yes. across. Yeah. Was brutal, yeah. but this didn't have to be that brutal. Right, right. And the other, the one when we were there, there was right outside of Naha. In fact, we could you could see Naha and Sherry from from this. It was called Chocolate Drop, and it was in the shape of a chocolate drop with dark brown and everything. And the insides were so fortified you couldn't believe it. There were railroad tracks in there where they could run the guns from one place, and the the um, burial ca caves for the for the for their burials and their cemeteries, so to speak, were just all fortified. All fortified. All fortified. Because when you, a lot of times, again, Okinawa is a coral island. Yes. And because of being coral, there was big water caves created by water. And you go to a wall, and then right on the other side, it could be a big cave. Yeah. And it, 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 it was rough. It was, you had no idea. No idea. And you're, and you're right. The only thing worse than being a, an infantry guy in Okinawa was being a combat engineer in Okinawa. I think so. And I so, really think so. Yeah. And yeah. to go in and say, hey, do you want to stay in the infantry or do you want to go in the quartermaster? Yeah. I, I'm not stupid. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what. The sergeant that was signing us, he said, you know, get over in that truck, Buster, and uh, go up to your company. And I said, well, what, what company? And he said, well, it's going to be the quartermaster. I didn't even know what quartermaster was. And I fought him, so to speak, you know. He said, you get your ass in that truck and you're going to change your MOS in 15 minutes. And he was looking out for you. There was yep. an angel tapping you on yep. the shoulder. Absolutely. I wouldn't be here today. I would not be here today. And you said you wanted to go into the 5th Air Force. Yeah. And you were one of the lucky ones to get to fly in the B-17 today? Yeah. How was it? Oh, it was terrific. It was terrific. And uh, I'll tell you, even as, what did I was 60 years ago, 65 years ago, um, we always envied the Air Force. They were the sort of big shots. They were the carefree. Uh, during Japan, in Japan, the different divisions and so forth would have in the football. In the, see, they had a football team, and they'd come up to Niigata. That's where I first was, and uh, play football, basketball, baseball, all of that stuff. And they'd come up, no ties. Uh, Hats in the back of their head, and oh, they, we were envious. But they but, also they also cheated too. Yeah. They got a lot of the professional ball players. Yes, going yes, in the Air Force. yeah, yeah. You know, you're a pro yeah. basketball player, pro yeah. football player. It's like, wait, I'm just a regular kid. Yeah. yeah. But after riding in today's plane, I really, really have tremendous respect for the Air Force. I mean, how those guys could be canned up in one of those bombers that are 19, 20, 21 years old and go on those missions uh, in the conditions that, and of course we, only, we were only um, 2,500 feet, I think, and it was just beginning to get a little cool. We all had enough, but with them, I mean, there were, it was 25,000 and, you know, no, what heat they could get from what was made at that time, how they did it, I don't know. And when you go in, like I was talking to Beth, just think, a 5,000 mile round trip yeah. in, in that plane. Yeah. Yeah. And you go, and the other part is like, well, you know what, you got 25 missions and you get to go, go home. And you go, wait a minute, it's like, well, 25 missions, that's, what's the big deal? You, you could do that in 35, 40 days and go home. But when you look at the stats and you look at the damage, basically, that's going up in the plane 25 times saying, I'm not coming back. I'm not coming back. I'm not coming back. It's almost like when we, when we boarded the ship in Seattle to come over. I mean, okay. as we went up the gangplank, that's just another thing. That, I mean, in our way, we were thinking, would we ever come back? And the Navy band played Sentimental Journey. <laughs> the, um, I know, <clears throat> I was, I talked to people before. I still remember August 21st, 1990. And people go, well, it's, it's my anniversary, but August 21st, because our first Marine Division Brigade, we were going to Desert Storm, Desert Shield. And we were the first ones going and being the logistics and we're packing up. 
and then it was the, the plane closed, the door closed. Yeah. And we all had, we had our three meals, we had 200 rounds. And I'm saying, wow, the Air Force is allowing us with this. I says, this is pretty serious. And then the, the door closed and all of a sudden it was a totally different thing. And it's like, wait a minute, I just saw my wife and kids. I may never see them again. And you're sitting in the plane and I was a captain at the time and I'm the senior guy and I'm looking around, people are sitting tight. And it's like, we're all scared shit. And none of us wanted to say we were, we were all yeah. trying to be macho, macho, yeah. Yeah. but you really, you know, I can describe it to you. You get the feeling, but it's kind of like, wait a minute, this could be it. Yeah. And, no. and you have to experience something yourself so. to really know what it's like. <clears throat> and the other tough one that I had was when we got to Okinawa, climbing over the side of the ship on the rope net. <clears throat> I never, my knuckles... <clears throat> Oh, My I, toes. I did that. I was on the USS Guam. Mm -hmm. and I was in the Med in 79. Yeah. That was when the, em the embassy was taken over in Iran, and we almost had to go. Yeah. And I saw a guy, you, you're coming over, and the mic boats are coming up, up and smashing <laughs> against the side. Yeah. And they told you over and over, especially the old timers, yeah. oh, step on the down. Yeah. Don't step on, on the, the up. up. One yeah. kid stepped on the up, yeah. and his leg just came right through. You're going right up again. Yeah. And people go, yeah. what? And it's like, yeah. you put the old Mae West on, yeah. and people you know, it is, People don't yeah. understand. They it's don't not understand. like the no, movies. No. The ship is going, and, you got, and it's choppy, and it's going up, and, and it's yeah. two metal just yeah. smacking against each yeah. other. Yeah. And, and the other thing was, because we had our pack on our back, yeah. and we had a rifle, and the damn rifle would hit you in the back of the head. And, you know, it all, but now we laugh about it, and, and I, because I'm here, I, I cherish that experience like nothing else before in life. And this, this plane here today just uh, really, really brought me closer to the Air Force. And um, it, was, uh, it was a great flight. So I had a, I had a cousin uh, that was in the 4th Marines. And uh, he landed on Saipan, and then he landed on EO. And he and another guy jumped into this hole on the shore at EO. And Bud said the minute they did it, and they knew it was wrong. Boom, they were hit. And he had a big leg problem. He lost a good part of his leg. And of course, then he went, he went home. But there again on an EO them. Uh, for some reason or other, well, on Saipan, I wasn't there at all, but on Saipan, the 27th Division was under the uh, generalship of, um, uh, well, what was it? his last name was Smith. How and uh, Matt, how and Dog met how well, and Smith. Well, the other one, on, on the Marines who was in charge of the whole thing yeah. was Mad, 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 Mad Man or Mad Dog Smith. Yeah, Mad Dog Smith. Yeah. And he got real teed off at the 27th Infantry because they didn't move fast enough or far enough. Yeah. And he had him... Uh, he yeah, had, the, the, the Army he, guy, General, relieved the commander. He had him relieved. And that's one yeah. thing in Marine Corps history and because then, that caused a lot yeah. of political problems. Oh, it sure did. And right on Okinawa, we had kind of a war with you guys in the Marines. Yeah. We'd, the, when the trucks and yeah. stuff... They played chicken. And, and then later you. on, um, we always, General Roy Geiger. Uh -huh. Roy Geiger was a pilot. And in the Marine Corps, pilots can be commanders of um, divisions and infantry. And so, yeah, for one, Roy Geiger, for, we call him the first uh, Marine officer being command of an army. Yeah. Army because that was part of it. I think that was on Okinawa. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but... But yeah, you know, but that's part of, part of the difference in people don't, don't understand. And sometimes you got to make those critical decisions. You can't worry about personality because people die if you don't make the right decision. Not only that, but, but that's war. That's war. That's war. Everything basically has rules and regulations. War, a real war. And I, I don't mean that to in, in, no, against the Vietnam or, or any of those. But like World War II, um, uh, what was I saying? You know? When the war, rules and regulations. Regulations. Uh, with that kind of a war, 
there was only one or two regulations, supposedly through uh, Switzerland, yeah, the Geneva, that, yeah. the Geneva, which didn't were work. not followed, didn't yeah. work. I mean, and the only way you win one is like, and the other thing was the Marines used to say, and, and the Army later or whatever, but take the high ground and hold it. That's right. Take the high ground and hold it. And people don't realize that World War II, the, the closest thing I would say you could come to World War II is like the Roman gladiators. Yes. It was. Yes. And that's why they, yeah. the, the Marines are always yeah. called American Spartans. Yeah. Because basically take the high ground or hold it. And that's part of it. You've got to fight and you've got to do what's necessary to win. To win it. And then you move on and do the same thing all over again. Yep. And very unfortunately and so forth. But the, the civilian population... Don't understand it. Well, not only don't they don't well they don't understand it here now here around here in a way, but uh, the the civilian population, the 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 casualties and stuff in the civil, and uh, with the civilization or uh, with the um, citizens of these communities, uh, was was tremendous also. Yeah, but some like fifty million civilians get killed, killed. in yeah. World War One. In World War One, two or two, and what? the buildings were blasted. And I used to say a little bit at times, especially when the war was over, I wish that this country could have experienced an air raid out in some farmyard, yeah. but just to get a taste of... Just that panic, that fear, that fear. helplessness. And when the planes came over and the sirens blew and all that and so forth. But uh, thank God it never happened in a way, but I think it would have done us a lot of good too. Uh, so uh, it's a... Uh, that's great. Yeah. Well, I want to thank yeah. you. I well, I want to I'm thank, honored thank for being you. With you. Well, I thank Did you, and I thank uh, all of the guys that are in the service. And so I, I feel just so sorry for them in a way today. It should have been over with a long time ago. Yeah. Um, there was an army general that grew up in Peterborough. Um, oh, Jesus. Um, oh, White. General White, I.D. White, and he was a tank commander of, I don't know, either the 2nd or the 3rd Armored Division under Patton. So it'll be 3rd Armored Division. Okay. Yep. And he was the only four-star general in World War II, he became four-star, did not graduate from West Point. He graduated from Norwich, you, you know, yeah. Yep. Yep. Norwich, cl and, top, a lot of tankers. Yeah. Swatchkoff, a lot of tankers yeah. come from Norwich. Yeah. And I got to know General White well because I live in Peterborough, and at the time I was working there, and I was with the uh, with the Rotary, and General White, when he retired, he moved to Dublin again, and I used to try to get <laughs> to his table because uh, it was a little teasing in a way, but uh, it was when Vietnam was was strong, mm. and all you had to do was mention Vietnam, and jeez, he blew his stack at the way it was being handled. Yep. And done, yeah. No, it's just like so, we won the war in 2003 in Iraq, but we're yeah, still here. We're still here, yeah. You changed it from a war, you won the war, and then you became an occupation. We won the war and lost the occupation. Yeah. yeah. MacArthur and um, I met the guy, was Bruce Clark, and he'd always say, mm -hmm. I'm not Monty Clark, the guy from um, Rome, mm -hmm. who, who came, yeah. who took over. And yeah. he said, so many p nations have won the wars and lost the occupations. So MacArthur and Clark wanted to make sure we never lost the occupations mm -hmm. after World War II, and we didn't lose the occupations. Whatever MacArthur did, as commander of the, of the Middle East, or the East, or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah, he did a fantastic job uh, with me. I, I was driving a Jeep, and um, when I, I'd come, I'd leave the captain someplace, and I'd sit out there waiting for him. And at first, you'd see these Jap guys kind of peeking around the corner, peeking around the corner. Well, in another week or so, they began to come out in the open, and then they began to walk around the Jeep. Well, one day, I put up my hood, and I, I swear to God, they, all you saw was feet hanging out. They climbed all over that Jeep like nothing. You know. But they also, we had a little room boy, and the Japanese government paid him something, and the United States government paid him something. And all of our KP, all of our stuff in the mess, and everything was Japanese. 
And uh, somehow or other, I just think it, it, it just gelled together. And he did a fantastic job. Because we didn't have any troubles whatsoever in and occupation. Him baseball. Oh, yeah, 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 now look at him. Yeah. Yeah. But, he, but we didn't have any troubles whatsoever with the Japanese in the occupation. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. You okay? Yeah. And thank you. And I. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Hey, it's great, talk, great, great talking with you. It's my pleasure. Uh, are, are you with Channel 8? Good, yeah, yeah, Channel 8. Yeah, okay, good. Are you living in Keene? I live in Keene. Yeah. I spent 21 years in Marine Corps, and I graduated from King State, came hey, back. Hey, <laughs> let's go there, Yeah, because I graduated from King State. I graduated uh, twice. Okay, well, I, I got a master's degree oh. there, too, also. But um, did you stay on campus? Just my first year. In Cow, Cow Hall. Hall? Yep. <laughs> Named after my father. Oh. Yeah. So it's hey, a really small hey, world. Oh, it's it's a, a small, real small world. world. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was named yeah. after my dad because yeah. he was there for 40 years.